The theatre. Now, I can't think what my company have in common this week, apart from the fact that they are all men. One is just about the world's most popular singer, one has made his name in politics, and one is just a run-of-the-mill comic genius. A disparate line-up indeed. They are Julio Iglesias. <laughs> Norman Tebbit. And first, a man who describes himself as a cross between a giraffe and a hovercraft, <laughs> and he lists his hobbies as gluttony and sloth. He announced his retirement last year, since when he has, of course, been busier than ever. Ladies and gentlemen, John Cleese. I'm always relieved when you sit down, John. <laughs> now, Terry Jones was on this show a few weeks ago, and he rejected the claim that you made somewhere that all the ex-pythons are dead, except for him and his bodily functions no longer work. He denied that. He said his functions well, do why work. why do you think he was strapped up like that? <laughs> Is there something I don't know? Oh, well, he didn't explain that. Well, he's not very honest. Michael Palin is not dead, I'm delighted to announce. He's actually in a home. He's in a home in Bath for people who've uh, <laughs> damaged their mouths by talking too much. <laughs> the lips are irreparable now and the, the, the tongue is worn to a stump. <laughs> but I go down and I take him out for tea sometimes. It's lovely to see him. And I, I wrote a part from him in, in Wanda, you know, in which he stutters, because that's all he can do now. But um, <laughs> it's hard to get his career going again, because he was going through a bad time. And uh, Chapman is in a home. He's in a home in Avonmouth for the terminally vague. <laughs> or rather, he thinks he may be. But uh, uh, Idol is dead. He's definitely dead because we took his, uh, his body down to the St. John's Wood Crematorium and Pie Company. <laughs> and um, and Gillian is, is brain dead. Only brain dead. But he's still directing. I'm so glad I asked. Now, <laughs> Wanda, A Fish Called Wanda is the film that you briefly alluded to, which I've seen. It made me laugh a great deal. Um, did you have to audition many fish to find your star? Yes, we, we combed the uh, pet shops of London. We eventually found a wonderful shop called Wet Pets. And uh, they gave us uh, an angel fish. But after the first day, we looked at the rushes. And the truth is, Michael, she wasn't beautiful enough. I'm being serious. She wasn't. So we had to let her go. And we hired another one who was much more beautiful and we put her in the tank that night. And unfortunately, when we came in the next morning, she'd eaten 32 of the extras. <laughs> we were being sued by Piscine Equity. Gosh. This performance that you give in this film reveals aspects of you that we've never seen before, as we will witness in this tender moment from the film. <laughs> front of the children now. Well, you know, I, I, I take my clothes off a lot in movies. People are surprised about this, but I was down to my underpants in Clockwise. I was stark naked in Meaning of Life. And I made a little film in 74 with Connie Booth, in which we both ran around in the buff for most of the movie. And um, I, su I suspect that it was you as you were then that made us forget it, put it out of our minds. But oh. you now, talking of gluttony and Loath, it's magnificent, it? isn't it? Superb it's young British body. surgery, yes. <laughs> it's wonderful what they can do now with plastics and so forth. But actually, I hired, when I actually discovered that we got the money from MGM, I ran, ran straight off and hired this fearsome American trainer called Josh Saltzman, who came over to work me out. He was very nice. He's from Connecticut. And uh, 
He said, okay, buddy. He said, uh, do some press-ups. So I said, uh, how many do you want, Josh? He said, oh, just go to muscular exhaustion. <laughs> so, see, he trained me for about six months or something before that. Because that, it's pure vanity in a way, but it's also true that because the love story is very important in the movie, if I actually took my clothes off and was my usual pale, flaccid, flabby self, it would sort of detract a little bit from the convincingness of the love story. Hey, you pumped iron. I pumped iron, indeed. Yeah. Now I you're... injected it. Oh. <laughs> oh, yes. yes. Well, Ben, what was I saying? No, you're... Uh, <laughs> your your co-star, Jamie Lee Curtis, let's see if I can get the quote right. She said, for a very old man with bad teeth and little hair, this film was a real accomplishment. Mm. No teeth, actually. I mean, I have no teeth at all now. I was talking to my dentist uh, only three weeks ago, and I said, I do have one tooth left that's my own, don't I? And he had a glance. He said, no, that went two years ago. <laughs> Apart from my hair transplants, you see all this? You see this? They're all gone now. I'm going to have to have some implants that side, because I'm told I'm a sex symbol now. And if I had, <laughs> if I had the teeth implanted there, I should be able to chew on both sides of my mouth, which I gather is essential for a sex symbol. Yes, <laughs> for women anyway. Now, what about this transplant then, John? Oh, well, I had three of them because I was going very bold. And they, it's, it's my own hair. You know, it's not a tooth Not taken from the armpit, right? <laughs> It's, it's all my own. It's just sort of redistributed a bit. Yeah, on a socialist principle. <laughs> two pays make you laugh. Yes, I think two pays are probably the funniest thing exists in the world. We used to play a game on Python when we were walking down the street. We saw a two pay. We'd all go. <laughs> <laughs> Why are they always ginger as well? <laughs> They're just terrible, aren't they? We did a sketch once on Python, which I adored, about a man going into the toupee department, you know? Mm. And when he arrived there, these people came over, well, three assistants came over to him with dead squirrels on their heads, you know? <laughs> and they all went on about how wonderful they were now, and you absolutely can't tell them at all. <laughs> Looking at them all, and then he said, in fact, one of them said, you may not believe this, but one of us actually is wearing a toupee. <laughs> I thought all three of you were. Then they all rushed off to the mirror and started checking. Yeah. I don't know, they're, they're the funniest things. I know, they are. And the great thing about a hair transplant is just... Sorry, did I make you jump? Yes, you did. Sorry. <laughs> it's, but it's just as, as, as bad and no worse as a, as a fairly long dental operation. I mean, it takes about an hour and a quarter. They take 50 little plugs out of here, and they take uh, 50 little plugs out here. And these they throw away, we give to the cat or something, and then they lose them. <laughs> and... Uh, Ten days later, when you've got rid of the scabs, you have hair up there. Forever. Forever and ever, because hair is not intelligent. And hair goes on growing back there, you move it up there, it never notices, keeps on going. You <laughs> keep aiming for your collar any longer. <laughs> How far would you go in the name of vanity? How far? Mm. I think the trouble with plastic surgery is they all look so terrible when they get old, don't they? You know? Yeah. So I think I'd draw the line at plastic surgery. I'd certainly get knee transplants if there was any chance of that. Uh, let me think, get the teeth back in. No, I think I've gone about as far as I can go. Thank you, John. Now, a couple of years ago, in a Radio 1 poll to find the funniest man in Britain, John Cleese was the winner. But my next guest picked up a few votes, too, along with Michael Fish and Neil Kinnock. But he is a man who has held high office, and his undeniable skill as a political tactician has impressed even his enemies. He is the Right Honourable Norman Tebbit, MP. <laughs> Now, next Tuesday, the 11th of October, you'll be returning to the same Brighton Hotel where you were bombed exactly four years ago. And, and is your wife, Margaret, going with you? Yes, indeed. Yes. Did she need to be persuaded to do that? No, no, not at all. It's um, what we would expect to do. A conference is there this year. We go to the conference. Last year, we went to Blackpool. Now, imagine that. <laughs> you know, I, so now we're ready for Brighton. How, how is your wife now? She's in pretty good shape, um, in good spirits, um, good enough to come out with me this evening. She said she wanted to see some fellow called... Um, <laughs> hey, 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 h
sorry. I thought you were trying to say Iglesias. I understand. <laughs> Oh, we know about him. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I did notice, having uh, seen her this evening before, that, that there is an improvement, isn't there, in your wife's uh, movements? Yes, she um, she has had some improvement. She, oh, I think it's about a year ago now. She found she could manage a champagne glass. <laughs> Fortunately, we've got her teacups now because it was getting slightly. Expensive. She didn't mind how she felt after that. Now, uh, forgive me for harking on about this, but it's still in everyone's mind, this experience that you went through. Do you actually remember everything that happened that night? Yes, yes, indeed. Um, it, it was not one of our best nights, you know, quite clearly. And I've, uh, I've spoken to the manager at the hotel about it. Mm. <laughs> uh, It was three or four hours waiting for the room service. That was the real problem, but he promised it won't happen again. <laughs> what, yes, what were you thinking about during all those hours of waiting for rescue? Was your mind quite clear? To the best of my belief. Um, to be serious, one wonders under circumstances like that, what the hell is going on? You don't know whether the whole hotel was down. I didn't know whether I was the surviving member of the cabinet or, or what. Um, no idea at all and in some ways that's the the worst of it you know, you're just there in total darkness um, wondering what the hell's happened and how long it's going to be before anyone finds you so very uncomfortable and holding your wife's hand obviously was a great help that's right and then eventually the very welcome horny hand of Fred the fireman who I, I don't think I've ever held on to another man's hand quite so strongly as I held on to his when it eventually got to me. Yes. You've escaped death more than once, of course. I mean, you were a pilot and you, you were in a very narrow scrape. What happened? Oh, that was a not untypical flying accident um, when, for reasons which we've never quite sorted out, you know, the Air Force blamed me and I blamed the aeroplane and everybody blamed everybody, so to speak. Um, I failed to take off one morning. Um, uh, on an air exercise and uh, my number two just took off you know you're supposed to stay in formation with him and I spoke to him about it afterwards said what sort of chap are you deserting me at the moment like this and um, I went on off the end of the runway and uh, the airplane came apart and it was all sort of rather uncomfortable for a while but um, yeah it's one of those things, I guess, uh, we get used to facing death if we use the M1 or the M25 terribly often, don't we, all of us? <laughs> has it, has it, both these experiences and others perhaps, ha had a lasting effect then on your attitude to life? Yes, to be serious, I think they have. Um, I think that I concluded from that first escapade that really I was fortunate to have survived and therefore every day is a bonus. Mm. And if you look on life like that, um, even the bad days are good days. Um, you know, even if it's an awful day, well, it's, it's still a great day because it's a day that you might well not have had. And I think it gives you a good attitude towards life. Now, you've got a, an autobiography, and I'm going to read a bit of this, hence the bins here. <laughs> and you talk about flying and you describe it almost as if it's a, a love scene. Now, John, uh, listen to this unless you've read it already. Um, it's about flying, and, and it says, um, it was sheer animal thrill, the physical exertion of handling the last RAF fighter without powered controls, the numbing, bruising ride on a bumpy day, the sweat of excitement, and the heat of the atmospheric friction as the two jets smashed the aircraft through the resisting air, all combined with the spur of competition and the thrill of danger. Wow, that's passionate stuff there. It was great fun at the time, too. <laughs> yeah. well, what's that kind of excitement about? See, if you're a total physical coward like me, you can hardly believe that anybody does that voluntarily. Well, I don't know. I, I don't think it's any more difficult, actually, than stripping off in front of the camera. <laughs> 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 depends what you go in for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's as brave as I go. <laughs> and what you do, Norman, doesn't hurt other people as well. <laughs> These escapades, I mean, zooming motorbikes and I think pranging the CO's car as yeah, well. Was, and that, that, was, that was not a good idea, I can tell no. you that. And reckless, uh, boozy parties. I mean, does this imply that you were, you were or are reckless, even perhaps irresponsible? 
well, no, I'm a very sober, staid, middle-aged chap. Um, but uh, I think anybody that doesn't sometimes have just a little irresponsible outburst when they're young is never going to grow well, up. I was say, have you ever been reckless? But because we've seen the evidence. <laughs> Have you though? Not all of it, actually. It was very discreet. <laughs> no, I never have. I've always been, you know, highly introverted. And uh, <laughs> the idea, as I say, of going mountaineering or riding a motorcycle very fast, I mean, it is quite clearly insane to me, and I'm going to leave it to other people in their diminishing numbers. I, I never rode my motorbike very fast. It wouldn't go very fast. <laughs> my mistake was the fact that I was victim of a plot. You know how politicians are often <laughs> victims of plots. Yeah. It happened to me from a very young age. And uh, I was persuaded that I could ride my motorcycle upstairs. <laughs> what I didn't know was that my friends, and I use the expression loosely, had loosened the clips on the stair carpet. <laughs> <laughs> so that as I was about halfway up, I was conscious of having to use more and more throttle to say <laughs> where I was until the inevitable and awful moment when motorcycle and I and stair carpet all finished up at the bottom of the stairs. <laughs> Three brushes with death. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've both been involved actively with uh, projecting politics and uh, politicians on, on television. Um, do you feel that humour is a very useful weapon in that? Yes, you have to be very careful about humour in politics, though, uh, because you can very easily be misunderstood. And, um, you know, sometimes people don't like politicians to make jokes, and uh, you, you have to do it very carefully. It's a shame I politicians don't use humour more. I mean, people are constantly telling me, oh, he's funny. I mean, you have this reputation, you know, he's very funny, but he doesn't show it a great deal in public. And I, I'm very curious why you don't. Well, I think sometimes one's, one's afraid, because a lot of jokes, um, there's some element of, which, which may offend somebody in some way. Now, you can get away with um, making yeah. a joke about people who are old or people who are young or people who are bald or people who are <laughs> lame or ourselves. something like that. Yes, that's right. Um, but when a politician does, you know, you yes, get the sort of 94 indignant letters very, very easily indeed. And if it's 94, you're lucky. You know. yeah. um, so one has to be very careful. But it's very persuasive, isn't it? I mean, if I can make a point, Mm. and make you smile or laugh at my point. You take the point. You've mm. agreed with me by smiling or laughing with me. You get away with it in the House of Commons, yeah. where, of course, if you're in a corner of some sort, the easiest way to defuse it, the easiest way to escape is mm. with a joke. And equally, if somebody um, gets a good joke at your expense in the House of Commons, the best thing to do is to really enjoy it. Stand there and laugh, you know, seething within, but you mm. laugh. <laughs> And you keep laughing for long enough to give you time to think about how you come back at it. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the jokes are very high order. But do you mind that the other, I mean, the Chingford skinhead and the... And the, <laughs> the way you're presented on... from Chingford and just look, I haven't had the transplant. What can I do about it? <laughs> and spinning image, the sort of death's head look. You don't mind too much? No, not particularly. I, mean, um, uh, I, th I think the puppets in spitting image are are very clever indeed. Um, I think the jokes are puerile, the script is puerile. It's a great pity the script is not up to the standards of the puppets. But I'd rather have my puppet than if I'd been um, David Steele <laughs> having his puppet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's absolutely awful. It must have been really destructive. <laughs> does uh, Mrs. Thatcher enjoy a laugh? Yes. Yes, she does indeed. Um, but <laughs> 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 yes, but, uh, but of course it's even more difficult for a woman um, in politics to, uh, to get the last to, to have a joke because um, so many jokes in fact have some sort of connotation which is just slightly off colour. Now you and I get away with it just, he gets away with it all the time, uh, but uh, for a woman it's very much more difficult, much more difficult. I remember one occasion, uh, I'll probably be put in jail for this because I think it's a cabinet secret that I'm with. <laughs> um, when uh, we were having a discussion, and um, it wasn't a cabinet, so it's all right, I hope. Um, and uh, somebody said, um, well, that's all very well. There was the Prime Minister herself said, that's all very well. We're talking about it from our point of view, but, but what do normal people think about this? 
and she turned around to George Younger and said, George, you're normal. What are you? <laughs> Everybody laughed and there was that pause before she said, oh, man. <laughs> Is she lovely when angry? <laughs> Depends whether you're in the firing line or not. <laughs> and if it's one of your friends, well, it is lovely. Because <laughs> your life is dominated by two Margarets, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. Are they in any way similar? Not really, no. Not really. <laughs> um, I think it's very convenient because, uh, you know, I didn't have to think what I was saying. You know, I could just say, yes, Margaret, very easily. <laughs> you know, whether I was at home or at work. <laughs> then I tried to do what I wanted to anyway. <laughs> In the book, you, um, you talk about your wife's uh, depression, which uh, she never had time in hospital. It was a very, very personal story. Did you feel a need to tell it? Well, we talked it over a lot, and um, as I think most people know, I've always kept my family out of the limelight in public life, and uh, I think for most politicians that's probably a wise thing to do. But we came to the conclusion that it was right to refer to those times because so many people face that problem and a lot of people in this country, any country, have faced problems of mental illness and it seems these days you can talk about almost anything else, you can talk about people having cancer, you can talk about them having AIDS, you can talk about them having almost anything and everybody talks about it quite normally and then you mention mental illness and it's as though something awful's happened and people want to move away and I don't think that helps anybody who has suffered any form of depression or mental illness and it certainly doesn't help their families in coping with it. So we felt, um, both of us, that perhaps it would help other people um, and particularly their families to know that people do get better because you know, there's an awful feeling that if somebody's mentally ill, well, they're going to be ill all their lives and it's simply not true. This led, of course, to you being mother and father for a while and yes. gave you insights no doubt into the terrible stresses of being a mother mm, mm, yes in every way in every way I, how our young son survived I don't know but you know, I can remember picking him up and saying go to bloody sleep <laughs> <laughs> so I mean people who do go it's very effective actually he did <laughs> in three months at the time <laughs> and did you become a good cook oh, I've always been a reasonable cook um, and uh, you know, wasn't a terribly good cook then, didn't have very much time. Um, you know, you, you watch Floyd and you realise how it's done, you know, little sort of drink now and again. <laughs> goes, goes very well. Chef's nips, I think they call it. Of course, uh, gluttony is one of your hobbies, John. You're very interested in all that. Yes, I give it up slow if I don't have the time for it. But I can... <laughs> Are you ambitious, Norman? Are you still hoping for ultimate office? I doubt if it'll happen. Mine, I only four years or so younger than the Prime Minister and um, I think she'll last a heck of a long time yet. Actually women I think really last longer than men. That's true. And, uh, so, <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I suspect that um, uh, I'll be drawing my old age pension before she retires and I hope that's the way it is. I, I'd like to see her go on for a long time yet. In the, in the world of popular music, there is nobody more popular than the man we're about to meet. Every 30 seconds, one of his songs is played somewhere in the world. And we're told he sells more records than Michael Jackson and Bruce Springsteen put together. Ladies and gentlemen, Julio Iglesias. You have some very attractive fans on that film as well. I mean, it looks like I'm surrendered for very beautiful girls. I don't know the telephone numbers, actually. <laughs> well, that's the first lie of the evening, right. <laughs> well, I remember I, I interviewed you on radio in 1981, which, of course, sticks in your mind. And I, <laughs> you were, you'd just broken through on the English market then. Your song had become a, a hit. And uh, your English was not so good. Have you studied it properly, apart from being helped by other singers? Yes, I've been, I've been for the last, um, I would say, five years, I've been studying this for three or four hours a day. Like a young student, trying to spend myself, myself like crazy because it's the only way. And now what happens is I can follow a conversation in English like 
with you and I can understand Mr. Norman and <laughs> understand your life very well. And you also. How many languages do you actually sing in? Sing in bad French, Italian, Spanish, of course, German, Portuguese, Japanese. Japanese? And English. That's hard. It's not a romantic language, is it, Japanese? Japanese is not so complicated when you sing because it's very, the phonetic is very similar than the Spanish one. It's, the ending is per, it's really easy for us. What's happening is it's just an emotional feeling. If you get involved emotionally in the song, you can sing. What's begin to begin in Japanese? I didn't sing begin to begin in Japanese. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Norman, did you, you interpreters have been vital to you, I'm sure, more than once. I mean, World War Three could break out if they didn't get it right. The site is nuanced, particularly with an Eastern language. Yes, um, and I, I speak bad French. Um, I worked quite hard to improve it, and it got quite good for a while when I was going a lot to Brussels. And I, in fact, used to do a certain amount of negotiating there, and English and French were the main languages. And they got mixed up sometimes, you know, it was quite extraordinary. But it was the only way to deal. Uh, but English makes you la lazy if you speak English. Everybody speaks English. Um, you don't. You just don't bother. If they don't understand, you just speak louder, don't you? That's <laughs> yeah. How does Forty Towers translate into Taiwanese? Well, it, apparently it, it works fine. I mean, I actually have a tape at home which starts with the music. Da -da 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 and Basil runs down the steps and says, "Oh, I'm yanking to hell." <laughs> I'm trying to figure out which Eastern language it is. I think it's Cantonese. It doesn't have a label on it. Yeah. Wonderful. Now, you've not only sold more records than anyone in the world, you've probably had more silly things written about you than yeah. anybody else in the world. Uh, for example, two or to three thousand lovers. Now, you're among friends here. What's the, <laughs> what's the truth? Uh, you look at me, I'm, I'm a very skinny guy. No wonder. <laughs> and the truth is, I'm a normal man. I, when I said 3,000 girls in my life, my mother looked at me like said, it's true, holy, and I said, mommy, you know, that's why I'm spending all day, all day in, in the house. You know my life. But anyway, if it's in the front page, it's okay. <laughs> spell the name correctly that's because good. sometimes you wake up in the morning and you read something about yourself which is my god this is not true and it's good because it's in the front page we love it but what happened is the next day you read something about another person and you believe knowing that what they said about you last night or last morning was not quite just so to answer concrete about the 3,000 girls maybe I have four or five girls in my life if it had been 3,000, it would have beaten John's record. That's no, it would have been a Guinness Book of Records, yeah. <laughs> Which you have been, of course, but for selling more albums than anyone else. <laughs> the penalties of mega fame now, Julio. Your, your father was kidnapped, wasn't he? Yes, my father was kidnapped four years ago. That's a, it's a, it's a big problem in my life because I had three little children. And and of course, after one happens that with my father, everybody has been concerned and it could happen again. Just as a feeling, you know, and then if nothing happens ever, maybe you don't get concerned about other things. But if once happens in your life, something like this, you get concerned about every single thing. Yes. What about yourself? Do you surround yourself by bodyguards? No, at all. Obviously, Norman, it is, um, security is something that you have to live with. Uh, does it impinge very much on your private life? Not a great deal, no. Um, and uh, I think it's far more difficult for some of my former colleagues in, in government, obviously, and particularly for the Prime Minister. Um, and then it becomes very restrictive. You know, it was, it was quite a factor when we were running the election campaign uh, last year that we had always to think about the Prime Minister's security. Um, but fortunately, uh, the people who work for us, all of us who have been protected, are uh, a pretty good bunch of chaps. Um, they're very skilled uh, professionally and um, 
they also have a great trick of, of knowing when to be around and when to move back and uh, I think that they're a great bunch of guys. And I suppose in a way they become like flies on the wall, in that sense that they're, they're well, there. Well, I've always swatted flies on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to be caught trying to swat them. Yeah, quite. <laughs> Might cause some problems. <laughs> Julio, you've achieved, of course, what most people will always simply fantasize about. You have it all, including your own jet, of course. And um, I'm sure you'd like one of those, Norman. Very convenient, yes. Uh, That's convenient. Yes. You're very right. Everybody so. should have one. Um, exactly. That's yeah. what, I, what I think. You, where, where, you when, when we, when John, when, you're doing all right. What, what is left for you to fantasize mm. about? He has to play, John. Oh, I just want to sleep for about 15 months. <laughs> 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 Yeah, please, that's what I feel like, it. I do have that effect on people. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't fit very well with the gluttony, does it? No, um, well, I have to get that over first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Julio, as I said at the beginning, um, every 30 seconds somewhere in the world, one of your songs is being performed on radio, and I think it's time for television. What's it going to be? Well, it's appeared in Woody Nelson is not here because I should sing within the song that you made me, you allowed me to sing by myself, maybe I can sing with Norman and John. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, wouldn't ad, I wouldn't advise you to have us with you. I was in a musical on Broadway once, really, on condition that I mind. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that, anyway. <laughs> You're going to sing live, and what will it yeah. be? I told the girl, which is just something that we saw first in the beginning, okay? Well, we'll but I don't, I don't write, I didn't write the song, okay? I just sing the song. And beautifully, too. Thank Muchas you. gracias, Julio Iglesias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to Norman Tedder. And John Cleese. And thanks for your company. See you next week. Good night. <laughs>